Hi, thank you. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Um, first of all, uh, you know, uh, talking with Galesa, uh, with Vittorio a number of times, uh, you know, I think we've already said to each other that we agree on about 90% of what we're, <laughs> what we're both saying. And I think uh, in today's presentation, I would say uh, I agree with almost 99% of what Vittorio is saying. Um, and I'm, a, I'm a definitely a fan of mirror mechanisms, uh, uh, and I'm also a fan of the notion of reuse. Um, but I, I think there are still some open questions um, and that Vittorio answers these questions in one way and I try to answer them in a different way. Um, so I think uh, here I, I would just want to mention two issues uh, central to the understanding of mirror mechanisms. The first one uh, goes back to Pierre Jacob's idea that rather than backward facing, mirror neurons or the mirror mechanisms are forward facing. Of course, mirror mechanisms are responding to something that the agent perceives. Um, so in that sense, their responsiveness is to an already presented stimulus. But the question I think of backward or forward facing is independent of that fact. The question is, what purpose does mirror activation serve? So on the simulation hypothesis that Vittorio will defend, it is in some way to match or replicate in my own motor system what I have just seen. And this becomes the basis for our understanding of the other person, a kind of mind reading. And that would be uh, what uh, Jakob calls the, the um, backward facing idea. On the, what I, I would call the inactive hypothesis, the mirror mechanism activation serves action preparation. So the idea is that it anticipates the action that I will take to respond to the other person or it anticipates where our actions are going uh, in some fashion. Uh, this would be, I think, the forward view. Mirror neurons serve interaction, or perhaps if we're simply observing uh, what we would do if we could interact. Uh, and they activate to anticipate what is to come rather than to match what uh, has already happened. Now, the question is how, how should we tell which of these interpretations is the right one? And uh, I, I always tend to cite a study by Caggiano and, uh, and others, uh, Fugasi, Rizzolotti and others, um, where uh, they're looking at the difference between uh, mirror neuron activation uh, for an action performed in peripersonal space and uh, an action, the same action performed in extrapersonal space. They're looking at macaque monkeys. And uh, they're doing single cell recordings uh, in area F, uh, F5. And uh, what they're showing is differential activations, depending on whether the other agent is within peripersonal reachable space or in extrapersonal unreachable space. I think such differential activations for reachable versus unreachable space suggests to me anyway, a kind of anticipatory action related response, um, encoding what I can do or what I can't do just because of the spatial differences. And in fact, um, Caggiano and, and his colleagues uh, Put it that way too. They they say the, these uh, uh, activations are encoding aspects of the observed actions, and I'm quoting them: aspects of the observed actions that are relevant to subsequent interacting behaviors. So again, it seems to me that would would support the inactivist uh, version view of of the motor mechanism. The second uh, issue uh, I would I would want to highlight. Uh, has to do with reuse. And uh, my understanding is that uh, the notion of reuse is sort of 
comes into play uh, on an evolutionary time scale and answers the question, um, a, a question like how, how mirror neurons came to be mirror neurons. Um, and that's in uh, contrast to using the notion of reuse on the time scale of a, of a token neuronal event, uh, which, which would be trying to address how mirror, uh, mirror neurons actually function in an, a current activation. So we'd be saying, we're, I'm reusing my mirror neurons in some way to understand this other person. I, I just find that an odd way of putting it, but uh, so my own conception here really stay, tries to stay on the evolutionary time scale. But even if we accept this shift in meaning, this kind of reuse of the term reuse, um, what does it actually tell us about the function of mirror neurons? So I've argued that reuse may give us a clue, at least, uh, if we think that the new use is still closely related to the original use, uh, which, of course, the original use uh, in, in terms of the evolutionary story is that mirror neurons started out as motor neurons. So it's about motoric processes. So that suggests that the reuse is, re is still related in some way to motor function or action preparation, for example, which I think would uh, support the, again, the inactive interpretation. Uh, Vittorio uh, continues to use uh, the term matching every now and then, although he's moving away from that term a little bit. Mapping, mapping, now is mapping because, because of the problems related to matching. Okay. Uh, you have, uh, it was very clarifying discussing with you on this map, uh, so it was great help in clarifying my views okay. uh, on, on the relevance of mapping with respect to matching. Okay, okay so there's that, uh, a shift in terminology there. Um, in any case, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that the reuse idea could go either way, that is it's to support the, a more simulationist story or to support a more inactivist interpretation. Uh, so I, I would just leave it there and-, and uh, Thank you. Happy you respond. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Shall I answer now or wait for the second? Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed, indeed. Okay, so thank you so much. I think this is probably going to be the meeting where our consensus according to your words, reaches, reached its peak. <laughs> you said almost 99. Um, no, uh, more seriously, I think you, you touch uh, two um, very relevant uh, points uh, in need of clarification. First of all, uh, uh, the distinction between backward and forward. I think we don't need necessarily to contrapose these aspects. Variety of reasons. It's not easy uh, to to be addressed, but I tried in this way. When we speak of mirror mechanism, or even worse, when we speak of mirror neurons, instantaneously through this incredible zooming in, we refer to the properties described uh, uh, about a few hundreds of neurons within the millions or billions of neurons that make uh, a brain. And by tagging those neurons with this name, we attribute this neuron uh, a sort of properties uh, that do not necessarily belong to this level of description. First problem. So mechanism is um, is more handy and I think more appropriate because it designates uh, one aspect of functioning that we discovered 30 years ago in a group of premotor neurons in the macaque brain. But these type of mechanisms or the families of mechanisms that can be related in a dendritic uh, uh, a tree kind of fashion to this original mechanism, which was the first 
out of similar mechanisms to be later on discovered in different parts of the macaque brain, in brains of different species. Now we, we can list mice, rats, bats, humans, okay? These mechanisms most likely serve different purposes in these different species. In singing birds, it's a totally different story uh, uh, if you compare it with echolocation in bats or in social behaviors uh, uh, like the sensitivity to another uh, uh, mouse uh, uh, pain uh, type of relation, like in, in the recent paper of Christian Cases and uh, Valeria Gazzola. Uh, different purposes in different species within the same species, uh, also different purposes. The experiment you were mentioning by Fogassi, uh, Caggiano and, and, and colleagues about uh, the sensitivity of mirroring uh, uh, um, uh, with respect to the distance at which the observed action occurs. Also show that the very same neuron that uh, respond when the action is far, but do not respond when the action is near, start responding again if the near action is observed through a rigid transparent barrier. This plexiglass barrier all of a sudden translates the near as far, not because of the physical distance, but because of the impossibility for interaction, which is something that is fully compatible with an inactive framework. But in order to interact with the other, I prepare myself on the basis of what I make of what the other is doing and what I can possibly anticipate the other will do in a while. If you want to dance a tango together, I must anticipate my own movement on the basis of the anticipation of your bowing, of your own movement and the tracking of the movement you're actually performing online. You see what I mean? So when we speak of mirror neurons, we, we speak of multimodal neurons that can display the properties we originally described, but we learn can display also other properties, for example, responding to the observation of the tool once the monkey becomes skilled in operating with the very same tool. When we first tested mirror neurons in 96, there is an image showing no response at all when the macaque observer a, a grasping uh, operated with the tool because those monkeys weren't able to employ the tool. We trained them to use the tool, we tested the neuron, they respond to the tool. They respond to the observation of abstract movement, but there's more to that, and we are writing a paper trying to address all these uh, issues. They sit side by side with other neurons that we originally described as mirror-like, which are not mirror at all, because they sit in a motor area, but they respond only when I see the other, but not when I myself, uh, I'm the agent. So you see, there is a network uh, a multi-dimensional network which maps the self in relation to the other. Some of these neurons are mirror neurons, and some of these mirror neurons have the properties we originally described, but other may instantiate other type of neurons. So, which means that the anticipatory role that you assign to mirror neurons or the forward-looking uh, aspect that in terms of motor control, my own motor control is fully compatible with the uh, uh, function I always attributed uh, uh, to this sort of mechanism, namely enabling me to make sense of what the other is doing, and even better to anticipate what the other can possibly do. Now, coming to the notion of reuse, I would say, broadly speaking, that the same evolutionary scenario can be applied. You can reuse something differently according to where you are 
in evolutionary time. So the singing bird reuses part of the motor loop that normally is active when the, the species-specific song is produced to map it when it, it is sung by its neighbor singing bird. You see what I mean? The notion of reuse doesn't necessarily require a similarity or total matching. And you are perfectly right that the use of the notion of matching was limiting, not the heuristic power of the uh, explanatory role of embodied simulation. It was falling short of capturing the empirical evidence. You see what I mean? So there are neurons that require that the observed action to be identical to the action control by the same neuron. That neuron control precision grip, if I see whole impression, that mirror neuron will not fire. There are the vast majority which are more liberal. They, they are more broadly tuned, like um, I think we, we, we used that term in, in earlier papers, uh, you see. Uh, so in that case, the notion of matching uh, would be misleading because the matching is not precise. It's not exact. There is a match in term of goal, but there is no match in term of movement. Even less so if I see uh, uh, an inverted uh, 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 tool uh, grabbing object, or in the case of humans, a robotic hand uh, grasping object, which also lead to the activation of the ventral premotor cortex or the so-called mirror circuit. You see, so uh, so that's why uh, after. Also, after many uh, discussion we had on this topic, I, I, I'm totally with you. Matching is too tight. It doesn't capture evidence. It, it, it's also limiting the heuristic power. So if you say mapping, if you don't, don't see, if you identify, but you say you map the similarity of the other, you can have both. You can have a relation of similarity, but also the difference that enables me to distinguish the other from myself. And so you disinstall uh, the automatic weapon of the leap argument, the projective aspect, uh, and uh, not preserving the alterity of the other, which I totally agree must be preserved at all costs. Otherwise we have projection, we have emotion contagion. So I don't know if I answered to your question, I will stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I just, Perhaps we can move on and then come later to Sean uh, uh, reply if there is one. Sorry, because there are already three questions, and uh, I, I'm so I'm I'm. If there is time uh, uh, at the end, we can back to to, to Sean. Thank you. you are Thank the you boss. to both. Thank you, the both. You are the boss. Okay, so as uh, as I said before, we can uh, just uh, uh, before uh, Tad's comments, which is the uh, the other uh, discussion, we just leave the, the the floor to a couple of questions. So if I'm correct, if the order is correct, the, the first one is by Alberto Lottorini. Marco, can you unmute Alberto? Alberto. Uh, thank you, Fabrizio and Marco, and hi, Vittorio. It was very stimulating as always. Um, my question as a sort of uh, is related to a curiosity about the notion of embodiment that you actually mobilize. That is uh, the sort of body that is uh, involved in your story is just uh, uh, the living body in the phenomenological sense, or is also the physical body. For some of the things that you say seem to apply to the first case, and some of the other things that you say play. To the second case. For you started by saying that uh, we have to do with motor potentialities, and the way I understand this has to do with dispositions. That is, motor potentialities are motor dispositions, and these dispositions have something like an intrinsic basis in our brain, which is possibly uh, performed by by the mirror neurons. And one might say that mirror neurons, uh, what they do is to implement, uh, uh, say some form of proprioception, uh, in particular, kinesthetic sensations. If this were the case, the only notion of body that would be mobilized in your story would be just the 
phenomenological notion of living body. But in the end, you also said that uh, the body, I guess, in the sense of the physical body, constrains the sort of disposition that we had, in the sense that if we had a different physical bodies, possibly we would have a different model dispositions, and even maybe possibly a different phenomenology. That is, our proprioception, our kinesthetic sensation would be different. For instance, if we were flying entities, if we, if we, if we could fly, we possibly would have also a different phenomenology because our body would be different. So I just want to press you on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, indeed, starting from, from the end of your question, yes, I totally agree. Uh, there's a way of using the body, and, and, and I'm doing this, uh, as you said, uh, just to say that uh, it is a, a physical constraint can perform certain things and certain movements, certain kind of relation with 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 reality or, or better with the with the physical world and non others. I can walk, I can run, I can jump, but as you said, I cannot fly. The point is, those bodily constraints, which, as I said, are in turn the evolutionary result uh, of uh, a dynamical interaction. So there is a physical world which interacts with the body, a body which works, uh, behaves uh, in a certain way because it is built in a certain way, is more adaptive, it is selected, it is better adapted, the body affects the physical world by interacting with it and radically changing it. There is no, not a thing so far away from uh, the idea of uh, nature as the landscape in Tuscany. It's totally artificial. It's totally uh, um, man-made. So you see, uh, so I totally agree. The other, so there are many bodies in this story. Uh, you're right. Uh, my short answer to you, the first part of your question would be the following. In a way, we all study the Körper, in the particular case, a part of the Körper, which is uh, uh, the brain, in order to understand uh, the life, the experience, starting from the life, as I said. Then you can move to start uh, uh, more detached or cognitive uh, aspects uh, of, of mental activity. Uh, um, but I think uh, from um, a, a merely uh, epistemological point of view, I think if we start off with experience uh, level of description, you're much better off. Um, so in that particular case, uh, the Kerper, which is not only the neurons, that's why I said we should leave behind a, a neurocentric neuroscience, uh, because the more we dig, the more we discover the very uh, uh, multiplex of relations that the brain entertains with a big, big variety of other body parts, uh, like the intestine, uh, the heart, uh, the lungs, uh, the blood vessels. Uh, so. It's an holistic system. It's an holistic dynamic system. Uh, uh, and uh, um, according to our discipline, we, we zoom in, we look through a peeping hole and we, we, we zoom on, on the brain and some other people uh, uh, zoom uh, on the heart. Uh, uh, some people try to think, well, we could couple the two. And so now we, we have a lot of uh, uh, research on uh, uh, brain heart coupling, uh, then what's going on in, inside the body uh, comes to the surface uh, in the sense that becomes the object of, of, of uh, very interesting research in cognitive science, uh, uh, the enteroceptive self or, or interoception. So there are multi dimension. Each of these dimensions requires its granularity, its level of description. It, but I, I, I seriously doubt that uh, one single unified model 
will ever be able to cover non-ambiguously, coherently, in a falsifiable way, all these sides of this uh, multiplex that is what we, we, we call uh, being, a, being human or being a human being. I don't even think it, it would be useful. I think we, we start, we should continue to discover how many sides this solid are, has uh, um, and try to uh, uh, connect the dots the more we can. Connecting the dots, I think, uh, is at, even operationally at the level of neuroscience. So uh, speaking not uh, anymore of the properties of single neuron or single brain areas, but uh, in terms of circuits, uh, the relation between the circuitry activity and resting state, uh, there are a varieties of scale uh, that can be employed and each of these scale brings something with it, unless it becomes uh, a theory of everything. The same applies to predictive coding, minimum energy principle, uh, uh, or uh, stupid question, but the brain is a computer. Does the brain work in a, like a computer? In a way, it does. <laughs> but the point is that if we stick to that uh, monolithic and one-sided vision of the brain, we, we don't go much far either. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Alberto. Um, so we we'll, uh, have still time for a question from the attendee. Please uh, keep keep it brief that because we got, we we still have a one uh, one discussion. Tad. So uh, Luis, Marco, and you, please, Luis. Okay, fine. Thanks. Um, hi, Vittorio. I have a question concerning intersubjectivity and social cognition. Um, Two theses are of particular interest here. That is that the mirror mechanism provides the direct mapping that is primarily intrapersonal, since it concerns the mental states and processes that an individual undergoes. And then the uh, embodied simulation involves the reuse of one's bodily representation involved in acting and experiencing. And these are involved in representing mental states and processes in of involved in observing someone else's uh, movements. And then you conclude that uh, ES explicates intercorporeal intercorpor oh boy, intercorporeality as the foundation of intersubjectivity. So my yeah. question is that do we merely have a very basic functional intersubjectivity here? Is a who system necessary to go beyond intrasubjectivity to achieve inter-subjectivity, yeah. as a number of people have suggested. No, I think uh, the, the mechanism I described uh, uh, um, in a very sketchy way uh, today, uh, uh, this kind of mechanism intrinsically, because of the way they operate, or at the very least, the way we understand their functionality by studying them, doing uh, the recording neurons, uh, doing brain imaging and the like, they do both. They simultaneously are reused when uh, I don't feel any touch, I don't experience any emotion, I don't produce any movement, it's the other expressing a sensation and emotion or performing uh, uh, an action. However, when this occurs, this mechanism doesn't be, uh, uh, behave in an exactly matching, identical way as when I feel the caress, I'm in sorrow, I am happy, I grab uh, uh, this pencil. You see what I mean? Both in terms of intensity of the discharge of the very same neuron mirror neuron fire with greater intensity when the grasping is being performed with respect to when okay. it is being observed. Okay. When I feel genuine disgust, my anterior insula is activated, but it dynamically connects with parts of the brain which are partly different from those, the very same anterior insula dynamically connects when I'm exposed to the facial grimaces 
of someone else, which most likely is experiencing disgust because I am able to simulate reusing part of the circuit it normally kicks in when I feel disgust. So it's never identical. So at the beginning, for example, Mark Genero um, came up with the idea just because we, we were sticking so much on the matching aspect because we were focusing on demonstrating that the mechanism was working both ways. And we were uh, emphasizing the matching hypothesis. So very reasonably, people like Marc Gianero, I think he, he wrote that already at the end of the 90s, uh, if the system exactly matches the other, then we desperately need a, a supervisioning who system in charge of distinguishing who is who. But we don't need such a system. The system itself is sensitive to the agency question. So behave differently when it's me with respect to when it's you. I don't know if I- asked. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Louise, and thanks, Vittorio. So now we invite uh, Tad Zadivsky. Uh, let me open his microphone. Ted, please, you're welcome for your comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. D can I also uh, ask you to allow me to post something in the chat that everyone can see? Is that possible? Because uh, right now my only option is all panelists, but I'd like to share something to the whole audience. Is that possible? Or? Well, uh, you can uh, send uh, it to me and then I can share it to everybody. We don't see you. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I, 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 you know, I made myself very beautiful for you, but sadly, <laughs> I can't be shown because, because uh, my app won't work. I, uh, it will only work on uh, my browser and the video is not hooked up to the browser. So okay. you have to be satisfied with my disembodied voice. I'm very sorry. Okay. I'll do my mm. best. <laughs> Sorry okay, about well, that on the technical side. You can you can send whatever you want in the chat and I can share it as widely as let everybody. Okay, well I'm I'm first gonna post a quotation from uh Vittorio's uh paper that was shared uh originally in preparation. So I just I just shared it. I, I'll read it. Of course, this matching may also allow for interpersonal similarity of mental states or processes, but the latter would be strictly dependent upon the interpersonal sharing of the same neural and cognitive resources. I, I like this quotation. And by the way, I want to say I also agree with 99% of uh, everything Vittorio said and, and Sean. But what I want to explore in my brief comments is um, how this relates to a view that I have been defending, as well as, uh, you know, uh, drawing on a concept first introduced by Matteo Mamelli, uh, mind shaping, uh, but also uh, defended by uh, Victoria McGeer. Uh, she calls it the regulative role or regulative dimension of folk psychology. And the reason I want to relate uh, these two is it, it strikes me that Vittorio's ideas are, are a great um, model of how the brain implements what I call mind shaping, what Victoria calls the uh, regulative role of folk psychology. And uh, what, what's particularly striking is this two uh, bi-directional uh, functionality. Uh, for B both Victoria and myself, um, sociocognitive concepts, the resources we use to anticipate the behavior of others, um, have a uh, um, have a, a, a bi-directional function in the following sense. They are used to shape uh, ourselves um, into better um, partners on in sociocognitive interactions. So a good example, for example, is uh, the acquisition of skill, which Vittorio mentioned today. Uh, uh, re in response to Sean, uh, the idea that the monkeys had to acquire certain skills before 
their mirror mechanisms became tuned appropriately to recognize the behaviors of others who already have those skills. And I think that that's the key idea behind mind shaping and uh, the regulative role of folk psychology. The idea being that we can't read others' minds, we can't anticipate their behavior until we are turned into the kinds of people, um, the kinds of subjects that can uh, interact with them in appropriate ways through uh, motor learning, through acquisition of skills. So an example is when you learn how to play chess, um, part of what it means to learn how to play chess is to learn how to understand and interpret other chess players better. But not just this, it is also to become more easy, easily interpretable by other chess players. Another example is think of acquiring a language. When we learn a language, we learn a tool um, for better anticipating behavior of other people, other speakers of that language. But we also, by the same token, become easier to interpret by other people, right? Um, and so uh, on, on the mind-shaping view, our, our various socio-cognitive resources um, have a, this double functionality. They're tools for better understanding people, but they're also tools for turning us into uh, um, individuals who are better understandable, more easily understood, easy, more easily interpretable by other people, right? Um, and uh, so so I, it strikes me that this perspective, uh, I mean, in my view, this is um, uh, this fleshes out the language that people like Vittorio use when they talk about the sociocultural and intersubjective uh, background of, of social understanding. Uh, this puts a lot of meat on those bones. What culture is about on this perspective is turning us into, through these mind-shaping mechanisms, turning us into the sorts of creatures that are uh, better able to interpret our fellow members of our culture, but also more easily interpretable by others in our culture, right? At the same time. So the same set of tools has this double functionality, right? And it strikes me that the, the mirror mechanisms uh, that Vittorio talk, talks about are sort of an ideal neural basis for how, how these uh, socioculturally based uh, uh, tools sociocognitive tools uh, come to be implemented on human brains. Uh, the, the only thing I would sort of, the slightest quibble I'd have is with the, the, some of the language around reuse is the idea that these uh, like mirror mechanisms have a primary function, which is sort of solely motoric that then gets reused for other things. But uh, in the sort of mind shaping view that uh, uh, that I have defended, um, the the bidirectionality of these resources, the fact that they can be used both to transform the interpreter and to better understand the object of interpretation, is uh, and e those are equally those have always been equally the functions of these mechanisms. It's not one, that one is primary and the other one isn't. Their role is to facilitate social interaction through this kind of um, uh, transformation of individuals into both better interpreters and better interpretive objects at the same time. And this dual functionality has always been there. Um, and so, so it's not really a matter of reuse. It's a matter of using things um, for uh, in, in this double way. And, and one of the arguments I have pushed in favor of this is that otherwise we're very, um, it's very difficult to understand what other people are doing. So if you, if you have ever tried to follow someone who, from a very different culture than yours, um, you will know that it, interpretation becomes exponentially more difficult the less you have in common with someone, right? And so... And this is at the level of affect. I really like the way Vittorio folk, uh, talked about how mirror mechanisms can be applied to the uh, case of emotions. Um, if sense of humor, I think, is always a great one, right? Um, as a person who's an immigrant to, I, I mean, I'm a child of immigrants to Canada from the Slavic world. And I tell you that the sense of humor 
that I grew up with is very different from the sense of humor of, of North Americans. And, and it, so this is just an example. But the, the, po the broader point is the following, that um, without these tools that transform people as interpretive objects as well as interpreters simultaneously, um, interpretation becomes exp exponentially more difficult. And so I think this dual functionality is there from the beginning. It's not a matter of reuse. Um, I'll just share one more thing in the chat, which is a link to a re recent uh, paper where I, um, uh, you know, outline this kind of perspective. Okay, that's all I have to say. I'm happy to hear what either Vittorio or Sean have to say about this or members of the audience. Thanks again for uh, the opportunity to participate. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, for your comment, uh, which uh, uh, brings along uh, a great curiosity, I, I want to. So I'll start with the with the link you sent, uh, which actually uh, I saw it appear on the screen, but uh, I don't see it anymore. I'm in the question and answer section. Yeah, you you got to go to the chat section. Actually. It's in the yeah. chat. Two different oh, sections. I see, I see, I see. Great, great. Okay. I'm afraid we, we cannot take uh, more uh, questions, but we have time for a quick answer from Vittorio. Thanks, Ted, by the way. Yeah, I, I would like just to uh, uh, to thank him, uh, to thank Ted uh, uh, by by saying this. Um, I, I, I totally see his point on the, um, the possibility that the use of the notion of reuse uh, might be uh, somehow lead to misunderstanding. Uh, um, I mean, uh, we do our best with when we choose words to to designate uh, continuous dynamical uh, biological phenomena. Um, I myself started using the notion of uh, neural exploitation. So the same neural mechanisms are exploited. Uh, for a variety of functions, uh, which might be more uh, stand the hand um, when when referring to the um, the brain area activated when during reading, uh, uh, spoke of neural recycling. Uh, then Michael Anderson uh, used the notion, uh, also used by Susan Hurley, reuse, and I thought, well. Why, why keep it on using neural exploitation? It sounds pompous. Uh, either use it simpler, and I stick to that. But I see totally. I totally see see your point, and uh, you're right. I mean, uh, when, when introducing my talk, uh, if I think about it, I, I I use quite often this this gesture when I was speaking about the loop. This is quite, this gesture is quite new. Uh, for me, I, I tended to use this more frequently, and I think the use of this gesture comes from my, my late readings. Phenomenology was very important uh, at the beginning and led me to, to the experiential aspects uh, of social cognition and the like. But um, I also found very interesting uh, the contribution of uh, pragmatism, a social practice theory, some sociology, like the notion of habitus, um, uh, and within this uh, uh, theoretical framework, uh, the the idea that um, so social norms, uh, social practices strike back, so to speak. Uh, uh, um, and, and modulate or or literally shape uh, uh, the bodily dimension uh, of the self. Uh, uh, it's 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 central in this line of thought, and I, I think it, uh, it it helped me uh, to see uh, this aspect more clearly than I did uh, when I was uh, more 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 deeply into Merleau-Ponty's time or Heidegger or Schutz, these people. Thank you so much.